Welcome to the class of uh, advanced uh, life insurance uh, mathematics. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, the multi-state models that we introduced uh, last week. And last week, we particularly focused on yeah, the definition of the states, uh, the possible transitions, uh, and so on. Let's say the, the rules of the game. And last week, we also focused on calculating the, uh, tr the transition probabilities and the transition uh, from the transition intensities uh, between two states. And now we really want to put this into practice, uh, the actuarial practice uh, more specifically. And we want to be available to use this, uh, this, this tool and the corresponding uh, transition probabilities and intensities to actually do an actuarial kind of uh, calculation. And of course, for an actuary, uh, one of the basic calculations is to calculate a premium. So how would you do that in a multi-state setting? And on the other hand, besides uh, the pricing, the premium calculation, how would you calculate a policy value in a, in a multi-state? Yeah, so that's going to be the focus for today. If time allows, I will also say a few words about multi-decrement models, but that's not actually something new. That's just a particular kind of multi-state uh, multi-state uh, multi model. Yeah, so premiums, policy values, these are really the two takeaways uh, for today's uh, session. Good. So that's what I mentioned over here. Uh, we're going to look at insurance products, so we're going to look at annuity products in the multi-state setting, or we're going to look at insurance type of products. Uh, all of that is possible, and we're going to frame them into this general setting of multi-state uh, model. Before we do that, um, I included a few sheets to, to give you a quick recap on what premium calculation is, what uh, policy valuation is, in the context of a life insurance setting. So I know that some of you uh, took the course on basic life insurance uh, mathematics with my colleague, Professor Jan Dane, so they should be fine and they should uh, have a working knowledge of, of these concepts. Those students who didn't take this uh, course, once again, I refer you to the data camp uh, course that I made with, with Robert Belen to refresh or, or to get a first introduction about these uh, concepts. Or alternatively, I refer you to the first chapters in the book by Dixon, Hardy, and Walters, where these concepts are introduced. Yeah. So what are we going to uh, look at? Well, first of all, let us look, uh, as a recap, huh? let us look at the cash flows involved in a traditional life insurance uh, contract. So what you are going to uh, pay to your client, to your policyholder, is a certain annuity benefit if you sold the client an annuity product, or you're going to pay this uh, policyholder a certain insurance benefit if a certain stipulated event happens during a well-defined uh, time period. Yeah? So that's what's going out uh, from the insurance company to the clients. And on the other hand, of course, in return, the policyholder is going to pay you certain uh, premium income. So that's what from the point of view of the insurance company, that's the inflow of, of cash. Okay, we have one particular thing here. These are the expenses. Uh, so usually that's a bit confusing for students, but of course an expense, uh, like for instance, a fee that you as an insurance company have to pay to your broker who is actually selling your product, or a fee that you as an insurance company have to pay to a certain a claim handler or an expert that is investigating a claim and so on. That's a cost, that's an expense, and this is uh, an outflow of cash from the insurance company to an external party. So I have to put it here in the outflow. Okay. Both are generally life contingent because you pay premiums as long as you are alive, and then the insurance benefits will be paid in the event uh, of death. Uh, the annuity benefits will be paid as long as somebody is alive. So these streams of cash are life contingent. And we're going to define the so-called loss as the out minus the in. Yeah, that's what uh, we define as the, the loss vector, if you want, over time, from the point of view of the insurance uh, company. 
So here's my favorite uh, picture. So I try to wrap up uh, the basic uh, life insurance mathematics course in one display using uh, superheroes. Huh? Um, because what we see here is we have our insurance company, we've got a certain policyholder, in this case it's a superhero, and the superhero engages in a certain life contingent uh, policy. And we here have the different uh, streams of, of, of cash, which I already discussed uh, before. So we have the premiums going from the policyholder to the insurance company. We've got life annuity benefits from the insurance company to my policyholder. For instance, think about a retirement product or something. And we've got the, the debt benefits. And these, of course, uh, will not flow from the insurance company to my policyholder uh, because these are uh, in the policy to cover or to, to, to come up with a financial compensation when the policyholder dies. So these will flow from the company to the policyholder's uh, beneficiaries. And that can be his kids or her kids, can be a bank in case of, case of a mortgage, can be your business partners in case you have a certain uh, own business for which you uh, want to make sure that this business can operate, can continue to operate if uh, one of the owners uh, uh, dies, right? So if you look at this loss, which I defined on the previous uh, sheet, if I would write it down in a kind of discrete time vector notation, I would uh, refer to it like this. So these are the insured amounts in orange in case of death in the first year and the second year and so on. These are the annuity payments, again, in discrete time in the first year, second year and so on. And this is the stream of premiums that I would pay in each discrete time period. So if I make this difference, I've got the, the loss uh, vector, which I want to consider here in discrete time, right? So uh, how does that bring me to the concept of a premium? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the net future loss random variable in the book denoted with L0N, N is for net. Zero is for, we put ourselves at time zero, so really at the inception, at the beginning of the contract. And we define the loss as the present value then of the benefit outgo minus the present value of the net premium income. So the only difference with the visual from uh, the previous sheet is that we're now going to work with this present value. Uh, so we value all the cash flows at time zero in this case. And the gross uh, future loss random variable is then denoted with a G. And then the only difference is that on top of these, uh, the benefit outgo, you also have to take the expenses into account. And please make sure that you put that with a plus in this, um, in this expression for the reason that these uh, expenses, like I mentioned earlier on, it's also flow of capital from the company to an external Party. And the premiums should, should be sufficient to cover both the expenses and the outflow of insurance benefits. That's the idea. So how do we calculate a premium? Uh, well, the very basic premium uh, principle or way to calculate a premium in actuarial science is to look at this uh, loss, random variable, and to make sure that the expected value of this uh, random variable is zero at time zero. So to, we make sure that there is an equivalence um, between the expected uh, outflow of cash from the point of view of the insurance company and the expected value of the inflow of premiums. And we make, it, we make sure that in terms of the expected values, we've got an equivalence at time zero, and that is how we calculate the premium Typically, and we call that the equivalent net premium or the premium determined by actuarial uh, equivalence. That's the idea. Yeah, so that's our most common premium principle. Uh, that's also what we will use uh, for today's illustrations. But then, of course, in the context of a multi state model, there are other premium principles. These are described in the book. Um, whenever we would need them, we would uh, dive a bit more into, into these. Yeah, so that's important. Here you see that I'm using the acronym EPV. So EPV is for expected present value. So I need an expected value because I'm dealing with a random variable. And this random variable represents the present value of a certain cash flow at 
time series. So what we're going to do is we enter section 8.6 from the book, all about premium calculation in the context of a multi-state model. Yeah, that's the goal. So say we have a life HX who's currently in state I of such a model. Um, what happens if I want to put a value on an annuity of one per year, payable continuously, while the life is in some state um, J, right? So that's perhaps a bit of a difficult product to, to start with because it's uh, paying in continuous time, which is of course uh, an artificial construction, but it's good to think about this concept as a kind of limit situation. Uh, so what are we gonna do? We have one euro per year payable continuously. We sell this product to somebody who is occupying state I at time zero. And the annuity will only pay if, we, uh, if our policyholder is in some state uh, J, right? So what do we have here? We're going to use an indicator function uh, that, is gonna be, that is taking the value 1 if this condition is true and 0 otherwise. So whenever you are in state J at time t, the indicator will uh, give us a value of 1. So that means that at that point time t, there will be a payment, right? And now we have the e to the power of minus delta times t to make sure that we go from time t to the present value at time zero. So the e to the power of minus delta times t, that's our discount factor. And here it's a discount factor uh, that is working in, in, in continuous time. Yeah? And then I take the integral over all values of t, because whenever this condition is fulfilled, my uh, continuous annuity should, should, should pay, should pay a certain benefit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the expected value of this guy um, because I want to be able to calculate the expected present value of this annuity uh, product. So that's the reasoning. Um, if this is really something new uh, to you, then look uh, look back in the Dixon book to uh, annuities in continuous time. Perhaps a rabbit is going to enter the room, but um, perhaps not. Okay, um, sorry, <laughs> sorry that. Um, so if this is really new to you, then look back in the Dixon et al. book and check the section on uh, annuities in continuous time, life annuities in continuous time, because there you will see this uh, kind of structure again. Um, of course, for a simple annuity in the life uh, setting, the annuity will only pay uh, if you are in the alive state, right? Because that's the only possible scenario. There, here we are able to make a distinction and the annuity will pay while you are in some state J. Also do note the notation, mind the notation. I have A bar because I have a continuous annuity. I have X to denote the age of the policyholder at the uh, start of the contract. And I've got IJ to indicate, okay, at, star, at, at the start, my policy holder is in state I, and I'm going to pay while this policy holder is in state J. That's what I need. Yeah. So now, of course, if I work with this expected value, well, the random variable is in here. Huh? So this is a Bernoulli random variable, which takes the value 1 with a certain probability, takes the value 0 with the complement of this uh, probability. And we know what the probability is of fulfilling this condition. That's the uh, TPX IJ that we introduced uh, earlier on. So if I work out this expected value, I've got my valuation formula for my annuity in the context of a uh, multi-state uh, model in continuous time. So this is a very first important pricing uh, formula which generalizes the well-known formula for a continuous life annuity in the alive debt model to the setting with multiple states. Yeah, and the, in fact, the only difference, if you look at it from a notational point of view, the only difference is that you need to specify here in the uh, superscript what the i and the j uh, states are 
applicable to this need. Questions on this? So that's my first um, pricing formula. Okay. Of course, instead of doing that in continuous time, you can also do that in discrete time. That's a bit uh, easier. So let's say that our uh, cash is payable at the start of the year or at the start of the time period that we consider um, from the current uh, time on. Uh, so we start at time uh, zero with a policyholder in state I. And we're, we're going to say that uh, whenever you are in state J, one euro will be paid um, at, at that uh, point in time. Yeah? So what is then the expected present value of such a product? Well, we have to run over all discrete time points k, starting from, from zero. Um, and if we need to pay one euro at time k, then that euro is worth v to the power k at time zero. That's my discounting factor, right? And the probability that I will have to pay this one euro at time k is given by this transition probability. That's the probability that I will be in state j at time k, given that I'm currently in state i at time zero, right? And currently I have h x. Do mind the notation. So um, very similar to what we had on the previous sheet, but now we're doing the a double dot uh, instead of the a bar to indicate that this is a discrete time period but is at the same time indicates that the payments are done at the beginning of the year. Yeah, so it's a, an annuity product that works in advance. So payments at the start of the year. Good. Um, those were the two important uh, valuation formulas uh, for annuities, generalizing what we learned in the basic life insurance uh, setting. So now, of course, we also have to think about the insurance uh, benefits. And uh, we're going to see there uh, with, with, with an insurance benefit, what matters is uh, making the transition from one state to another. So with an annuity, it's about being in a certain state. Uh, let it be the healthy state to pay premiums, or let it be the disability state to receive uh, a, a replacement income every month or every year or something. Whereas with the insurance benefit, benefits, uh, what matters to us, what is of interest to us, is, is making this transition from one state to another. Yeah. So here are some examples. A debt benefit being payable on transition into the debt state. Or, for instance, a critical illness insurance paying uh, some insurance or certain benefit on debt or earlier diagnosis of one of a specified group of illnesses. Yeah, so that could be the kind of insurance products uh, or covers that you, that you can think of, just to name a few examples. So how is the valuation uh, formula, uh, what does it look like? Well, if we have a one unit benefit payable immediately on each future transfer transition into state K, given that I'm currently occupying state I, then I got the following pricing uh, form. Yeah. So I denote that here with capital A to indicate that it's an insurance product. Annuities are with a small A. I denote that here with a, a subscript X to, to indicate the age of my policyholder at the policy inception, at the time that I sell the contract. I've got the A bar because it's a product that works in continuous time. So it's going to pay at the moment of the transition. So not at the end of the year or something, but at the moment of the transition. That's what the bar indicates. And I've got the IK to indicate that my policyholder is currently in state I. And that what is of interest to me here is making the transfer from state I to state uh, K. Okay. And if you look at the valuation uh, formula to get an integral, because I work in continuous time, I have this discount factor e to the power minus delta t, because I'm going to think about, yeah, if I have to pay this one euro at time t, 
then it's going to be worth e to the power minus delta t at time zero. So that's my uh, discount factor to go from time t to the present time, zero. And then here, of course, I'm working again with what is the probability that this uh, payment is going to take place at time t. So in order for the payment to take place at time t, I should be in some state j, which has to be different from k, right before time t, let's say. And then at time t, I should make the transition from the state j into state k. So that's why the j has to be different from k. And that's why you um, get this transition intensity over here as well. That's in fact what we discussed last week, um, that tpx ij multiplied with this mu jk dt, that that's going to give you the probability um, that you, you're going to make the transfer into uh, state k in the time interval between t and t plus dt. Right. And of course, you let the t run, in this case from 0 to infinity, to capture all the possible uh, paths which are um, the possible paths that are possible in this uh, setting. Yeah. So a few uh, uh, extra words of explanation here on the, on, the, on the sheet. So when does a payment happen in the interval between t and t plus dt? The, well, first of all, the amount of this payment is then 1. That's because we look at a, um, at a kind of unit product huh, where the insured benef benefit is just one euro. Um, the discount factor then, uh, when you go from time t to time zero is e to the power minus delta times t. The probability that the benefit is paid is a probability that my life transfers into state k in this small interval right after time t given that the life is in state i at time zero. So that must imply that my insurance, um, my policyholder is in some state j, different from k, immediately before t and must make the transfer from j to k during this uh, interval. And the probability that this will happen, as we explained last week, is given uh, like this. So we have the magenta words corresponding to the magenta probability and the red description corresponding to the uh, red um, uh, expression here. Yeah, so that's um, bringing you up to speed in terms of the premium calculations. Um, uh, sorry, instead of, uh, that's bringing you up to speed in terms of the um, the valuation formulas for annuity products on the one hand and insurance products uh, on the one on the other hand. Uh, so make make the connection um, with the with the classic alive debt model. So with the basic life insurance uh, products, and then you will see that yeah, the only difference is that you need to take these different uh, states into account and the corresponding transition probabilities and transition intensities, but conceptually you're using the same kind of thinking to write down these uh, these epvs okay so how do these pricing formulas lead us to uh, premium calculations well then the only thing we have to do is to match the epv of income with the epv of outflow and, and to calculate the premium from this uh, equivalence yeah? so that's going to be our driving force this equivalence principle. We're going to assume that we start with insureds with lives in state zero at the policy inception. So let us uh, look at this example um, as a mean to, as a way to, to practice, um, to practice the, the valuation formulas on the one hand and then the reasoning in terms of uh, actuarial equivalence uh, on the other hand. So we have here a 10-year disability income insurance policy that is issued to a healthy life uh, 60 years old. And we want to calculate premiums for the following two policy designs. And the idea is if you really actually are going to do the numerical calculations that you're going to use the parameters from an earlier example that we discussed uh, last week. Yeah? So here I will more conceptually explain you how to do it 
and then the actual numerical calculation that's something that you can do um, at home or um, perhaps uh, later on in one of our tutorials so in the first design we're going to look at premiums that are payable continuously while you are in the healthy state there is a benefit of 20,000 euro per year that is payable continuously uh, while the policyholder is in the disabled state. And there is a debt benefit of 50,000 euro, which is payable immediately on debt. And the goal is uh, calculate the premium. What should my premium rate, because we call it a premium rate, if premiums are calculated uh, in continuous time, uh, what, what should it be in this, in this uh, context? Yeah, so 10 year disability issued to a 60 year, uh, year old. So let me do this uh, together with you. And let me show you that I actually registered for my app uh, last night. So the writing on the iPad should now go without any interruptions or any difficulties. So we're going to do example 8.6 quickly. And 8.6 is a 10-year disability insurance product. And we have a 60-year-old, so we're going to denote this with the 60 between brackets. So first of all, we have to think about what is our multi-state model. Yeah, so it's a disability income insurance uh, product. So the three states that I'm going to distinguish is the alive and healthy state. Then I've got the disabled state. And I've got the uh, dead state. Right? I'm going to denote this one with zero, uh, this one with one, this one with two. And then, of course, the transitions that are possible are like this, I can go like this, and I can make a transition like that. Yeah? So that's the, one of the multi state models that we discussed uh, last week. So it's important to start. With a, with a picture of this setting, if that's not uh, given already in the question. So we're going to look at three components. And first of all, I've got the premiums. And I'm going to pay the premiums continuously. So that's important. It's continuously in the healthy state. That's what I need to know about these uh, premiums. So that means you start in the healthy state. So I'm going to look at an annuity. So I look, uh, so if I look at the EPV of this guy, then it's going to be an A bar because we work continuously. We have an annuity here. We have a 60 year old and we've got a duration of 10 years. So that's denoted in actuarial science like this. So this refers to the duration or the term of my product. Yeah, and I start in state zero. And of course, I will only pay premiums if I'm in state zero. So that means that there can be episodes during this uh, time period of 10 years during which I leave uh, state zero, I enter the disability state. Uh, but as soon as I come back to state zero, I will start paying premiums uh, again. Yeah, so that's how you should read this, um, this expression. So you start in state zero and whenever you are in state zero, you are going to pay uh, premiums. <laughs> now, of course, what is the rate of, this, uh, of these uh, premiums? Uh, that's the most important thing because we want to calculate that. So I'm going to write this as a P, where P is the unknown rate that I wish to calculate. And this is then my present value of my uh, annuity. So if I write that with a fully detailed pricing formula, I've got an integral from 0 to 10. I've got my discount factor, e to the power minus delta times t. And the probability, given that I started in state 0 at age 60, 
Yeah, whenever I'm in state zero, in the time between time zero and time, uh, time 10, whenever I'm in state zero again, I will pay these uh, premiums. So that's the valuation formula that we just uh, explained, applied here to the valuation of my continuous uh, stream of premiums. Good. A second building block is then the EPV of the sickness benefit. So that's also a classic, of course, that uh, whenever I enter the disability uh, state, that I will get a certain uh, replacement income. And in this example, it's 20,000 euro per year whenever I'm in the uh, disabled state and this, uh, this, this benefit is paid continuously at a rate of 20,000 uh, per year. So in order to value this, I'm going to use the 20,000 as the given rate, and I'm going to use the valuation of a continuous annuity issued to a 60-year-old. Duration is 10 years. I start in state zero, and this guy is paying whenever I'm in state one, right? So the valuation formula here is 20,000 multiplied with the integral from 0 to 10, e to the power minus delta t, tp60, 0, 1, dt. Yeah? That's how I should value my sickness uh, benefit. And then last, the last component is the debt benefit, is about the debt, uh, the debt benefits. So I will have a benefit I will have a benefit of um, 50,000 euro that is uh, paid upon debt. And of course I can enter the debt state out of the uh, disability state or from the uh, alive uh, and healthy state. Okay, so if I write down the valuation formula here, the EPV is 50,000 and then the capital A bar, zero two, 60 with a duration of 10. Good. So do note, I start again in state zero, and this insurance benefit should be paid when I make the transition from state zero to state two. So if I write down the valuation formula in full detail, I've got the integral from zero to 10, I've got e to the power minus delta t, and then we have TP60, 0, 0, multiplied with 60 plus T, 0, 2, plus TP60, 0, 1, multiplied with this mu, 60 plus T, uh, 1, T. I'll take the integral over, over T, right? So the reason why I have these two components here is because I can make the transition into state two from state zero, or I can do that from state uh, one. Okay, so that's what I, uh, what I want to grasp with my pricing formula over here. So how to calculate uh, P? So how to get the P then? We're gonna write down an actuarial equivalence. And that actuarial equivalence is going to make sure that the premium income is sufficient in expected value to cover the outflow of the benefits. So that's this setting. Voila. So if I solve this for the unknown, P, then I get yeah, this uh, expression for P, which I need. Now, of course, if you ask, uh, how should I actually calculate this? Well, you will see here immediately that things become a bit more complicated hmm, uh, to do the actual calculation. So you can only calculate this with pen and paper. If the expressions uh, for the transition intensities, if, if, if these are very simple, if the expressions for the transition probabilities are very simple and so on. 
Uh, if that's not the case, you will have to rely on numerical uh, integration in order to, to do the actual calculations in this, in this example. Questions on this? So we started with this example and we valued the premiums, we valued uh, the sickness benefits and the death benefits, put it all together and came up with an expression for P, the premium rate. Okay, welcome back. I suggest that we get started uh, again. And uh, we're going to continue with a discussion of policy values in the context of a, of a multi-state uh, model. So I start again with my uh, picture here of the different uh, cash flows that we want to take uh, into consideration. And then do note that the cash flows, which I denote here in, in, continue, in discrete time at the bottom of my picture, that these uh, start from time zero on. Right, and that's something we're, we're going to change uh, slightly now when we're discussing policy values, because with a policy value we also want to look at uh, we want to look at a value of the cash flow at time t, taking into account yeah what is the the future cash flow that uh, that will come. Good. So if I look at the policy value, also called the reserve at time t. Then, using the picture from my, from my previous uh, sheet, what matters is the value at time t of the future, in this case, debt benefit. So that's going to be bt, bt plus 1, bt plus 2, and so on. The value at time t of the future life annuity benefits, ct denoted here, ct plus 1, ct plus 2. And then minus the value at time t of the future uh, premium. So I want to know with this uh, reserve, what kind of amount of capital would I need at time t in order to make sure that as an insurance company, I can fulfill my future liabilities towards my policyholders. So that means that uh, things I need to pay to my policyholders are contributing in a positive way to this uh, policy value at time t and income that I will receive from my policyholders contributes uh, with a minus, so decreases the policy value at time t. That's the setting in the alive debt model. That's the setting for a very simple uh, life insurance contract. And now we want to transfer this, this kind of thinking to the setting of, of multi-state models and wonder what is the reserve that we should hold at time t if we want to be able in terms of expected values, if we want to be able to fulfill our liabilities in the future with respect to our policy holders. What kind of amount do we need uh, for that? So here is a different uh, picture. Huh? So we put ourselves now at time t. We want to value at time t and we look at the future starting from t on. So that means we've got a policyholder aged um, x plus t at that time. Uh, we are at time t, and this is these are the cash flows that we want to uh, take into account. So I like to picture it like this, at least with a simple uh, alive debt model. I think that's that's a good way to um, to visualize this concept of a policy value calculated at time t. Okay. So we see this policy value as a kind of um, a balancing tool, if you want. Uh, so it's, determ it's used to determine the economic or the regulatory capital that is needed for the company to remain, to remain solvent. So it's a kind of amount of money that you uh, should be able to hold in order, in order to fulfill your future uh, liabilities. And how are we going to approach this in a more mathematical sense? We're going to look at the future loss random variable. So that is LT now. It's the present value at time t of the future benefits minus the present value at time t of the future net premiums. Yeah. So we denote, or we, we're, we're going to use this capital L again, L for loss, but now with a subscript uh, t, referring to the point in time 
at which we want to do our uh, valuation exercise. Uh, so previously, with premium calculations, we put ourselves at the start of the contract, at the policy inception, uh, so at time zero, and did our calculations at that point. Now we're putting ourselves um, at a future time point, uh, T. And again, you've got the difference between net and gross, uh, depending on whether you take the, the, the expenses into account or not. Okay. So that's my policy value. I will denote that with V for value. Uh, TV is then the expected value of this uh, LT guy that we have over here. That's how we're going to calculate this uh, policy value. It's a balancing item because it makes sure uh, it, it guarantees an equivalence, uh, at least in terms of expected value, between this policy value at time t, this reserve at time t, and then the expected present value at time t of future premiums, and that must equal the expected present value at time t of the future benefits plus uh, expenses. So it means that if you hold this capital TV, and if you put on top uh, the premiums which will come in in the future, then on average, you should have enough to cover your uh, future uh, expenses and your future uh, benefits. That's how we should calculate this uh, policy value. So this is covered in chapter seven in the book by Dixon et al. I do know that in the data camp course, we don't discuss this. Uh, so if uh, this is new to you, uh, then you should really have a look at chapter seven in, in the Dixon book. Um, it's not, I mean, you've seen all the, the tools that you need to do the calculation. Uh, uh, you know how to calculate, how to express a present value random variable, how to calculate it, its expected value and so on. But then this idea of a policy value is just using these concepts in a slightly different way, namely as a balancing item to restore balance at a future time t. So we leave the time zero perspective and we put ourselves now at some time t during the policy, uh, the the, the, during the contract or during the, the policy period. So that, that is what it would be in the uh, simple life insurance uh, setting in the life debt model. Uh, and of course, now our goal is to leave this life debt model, jump to any multi-state model that we would like to consider and uh, have there the notion of a policy uh, value. So if you look at section 8.7 in the book, we're going to discuss policy values, but we're also going to discuss how these policy values evolve over time. And that will be captured with a differential equation that is um, named after uh, an actuarial mathematician, Thiele. So that's going to be Thiele's uh, differential equation. So that's expressing the evolution of these policy values uh, over, over time. So we want to know the time t policy value for a policy that can be modeled with a multiple state model. So we need the expected value at time t of the future loss random variable. But here, and this is really important, here we're, we're have, we'll have to take into account in which state my policyholder is at time t. And the policy value will be state dependent. So you're going to hold a different policy value, a different reserve for a policyholder who is in the alive state at time t compared to when you have a policyholder who is in the disability state, for instance, at time t. Because if your policyholder is in the disability state, you could say uh, he's in the disability state, so I have to pay him a certain replacement income. Uh, and maybe it's not very likely that he's going to transition back to the, to the healthy state and so on and so forth. So the policy value is state dependent. And I say here, yeah, that's the main difference with the basic life insurance setting. Um, you could say, yeah, that's perhaps not, not, I mean, it is really, it is different, but also in the life insurance setting, if your policyholder would be occupying the debt state, then of course the policy value would be zero because then you have no longer any uh, liabilities or any obligations 
towards your towards your uh, your client. So also in the basic life insurance setting, you could say that the policy value is state specific, state dependent, and it is different for a policyholder in the, the life state compared to the policyholder occupying the dead state. But here, in general, with multiple states, um, this becomes even more apparent and even more important. What is the, um, or, or how can we express that formally? So we're going to look at the expected value at time t of the future loss rent and variable, conditional on the policy being in a given state at that time. So we're going to distinguish um, TVI, where the I refers to the state that you occupy at time t. So if I ask you to do policy value calculations in a certain uh, exercise, and if that exercise um, involves multiple states, then I really expect an expression for the uh, policy value at time t in each of the states that my uh, policyholder can occupy at that time. So it's important to take this distinction into account. Of course, to do any kind of calculations, you need a certain basis. So you need assumptions about transition intensities, you need a force of interest, you need to assume certain expenses. If there are any participating policies, uh, you need to take bonus rates into account and so on. So the only point that I want to make here is you need to put all this together and before you can do the uh, calculations of these policy values. All right, so let's do that with a specific example. We're going to look at the disability income model and we're going to assume that our contract has a duration of n years. It is issued to a life HX. Uh, the premiums are payable continuously throughout the term at a rate of P per year, as long as the life is healthy, so in the zero state. The annuity, an annuity benefit is payable continuously at a rate B per year when you are sick state or the disability state and then a lump sum s is payable immediately on death within the term yeah and so the question is uh, what are your um, policy values for a policyholder who is in the healthy state at a certain time t or a policyholder who is in the sick state at time t or uh, somebody who's in the dead state at time t what would be the different uh, policy values. And once again, I've got my three states. So the healthy state, which is zero, the sick state or the disability state, which is one, and the dead state, which is two. And I've got the transitions that are possible in between these states. So that's what I uh, want to start with. And um, I'm going to assume that I pay premiums at a rate of P when I'm in the healthy state. I'll receive benefits at a rate of B per year if I'm in the uh, sickness state. And there is a lump sum. So if I make the transition here, I'll get S, which is a lump sum. And also here, if I make this transition, I'll get S. Yeah, that's in a nutshell what this uh, policy is um, giving me. So what I want to know is what is the policy value for somebody who is in state zero at time t? for somebody who is in state one at time t, and for somebody who is in state two at time t. So the last one is super simple, because that's going to be zero. Uh, because if I enter the dead state, uh, nothing can happen anymore. Uh, there are no future uh, liabilities and so on. So that policy value is zero. Let me start with looking at the TV zero. So if I would write it down, then I'll have to look at the, at the present value at time t of the future benefits minus the present value 
at time t of the future premiums. And I want to make sure that I calculate the expected value of this guy. So I'm going to write the EPV. Okay. Given, so it's this is conditional on being in state zero. Um, yeah, being in state uh, zero at time t. So at time t, my policyholder is healthy, and I'm going to look at yeah, what is then the EPV of future benefits of future uh, premiums. So if you are going to look at the future benefits, hmm, what you see here is that there is this um, sickness benefit that I should value as an annuity. And there is, of course, the lump sum that is uh, the S, which I should value as an insurance product, because that's going to be paid if I make the transition from zero into state two or from state one into, into state two. So if I write down my uh, expressions, then I'll get for the future benefits, I'll get B times A bar x plus t and then i've got n minus t yeah, that's the future duration of the contract so um originally the duration was n i'm now at time t so the remaining duration is n minus t and my policyholder is now um and my policyholder uh, now has h uh, x plus t yeah so I'm starting in state zero, right? That's right now, uh, or sorry, that's at time t, I'm in state zero. And of course, I will have to pay this uh, sickness benefit whenever I'm in state one. So that's why I need to value it in the following way. If I look at the lump sum, I'm gonna use a capital, a bar capital, zero to, and then x plus t, with the remaining duration and minus t. And then the last uh, expression in here is the premium income, which I can value like this. Okay, so that is using actuarial notation. That would be the expression that I need in order to do my uh, policy value calculations. Okay, so I uh, make sure that uh, as you can see here, I'm in state zero, I'm in state zero, and I'm in state zero. And then I'm going to see, okay, I need to pay the sickness benefit while I'm in state one. I need to pay the uh, benefit S, the lump sum, if I make the transition from state zero to state two. And I will receive premium income uh, while I'm in state uh, zero. Okay, so that's how you do it. That's how you put things together. Of course, now you can write these formulas in full, like we did in the other exercise. Uh, you can do the numerical calculation uh, and so on and so forth. Huh? So then you can put uh, all of this together. Let us consider the same formula now, but for a policyholder. Yes. Yes. Uh, Annalise fragt, if you can add her, she lost connection back. Yeah, I admitted her. I have to do it again. Yeah. Um, so I already, yeah, now it seems to uh, work, have worked. It happens, thanks. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ansfried. So now I want to do this policy uh, value calculation for um, somebody who's in um, state one, the sickness state at time uh, t, right? So the scheme is still the same as, uh, as I had over here, but now at time t, this policyholder is in this state. So what can happen? Uh, well, same, same cash flows, huh? Um, whenever you are in state one, you will receive 
the annuity benefit at a rate B per year. If you would go back to the healthy state, you will start paying premiums again at a rate of P per year. If you make the transition at some point into the debt state, either from one to two or from zero to two, then the benefit uh, as, as a lump sum has to be paid. So if you look at the policy value at time T for a policyholder in state, uh, in state one, then I can say I've got the sickness benefit that has to be paid while somebody's in state one. The lump sum that has to be paid if we make the transition into state two. So do note that, okay, at time T, we are in state one, uh, but this product um, then also includes uh, the possibility that you make this transition into state two, either from state one at a certain point in time or from state zero, of course, and yeah, that's also uh, possible. And then premiums, uh, premiums will be paid uh, while somebody is in state uh, zero. So the present value, the expected present value of these uh, premiums uh, at time t will be captured, will be expressed by, by this term. So that's how we need to put the um, policy values um, together uh, for somebody in state zero, somebody in state one, and then of course for a policyholder in state uh, two, we already discussed it, that would be uh, equal to, to zero. So essentially the ideas are uh, really the same as we had in the, um, in the life insurance uh, setting. But of course, now we can have um, yeah, additional, additional states that we need to take into account and, 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 the exp and you really need to, to make this uh, difference. The policy value that you hold for somebody in state zero is not necessarily the same as what you would hold for somebody in state uh, one. Okay. Um, good. So what do I want to show now as, um, as, the next, uh, as the next step is that we can think about the evolution of these uh, policy, uh, policy values. And that's going to be quite, um, uh, quite interesting. So as you see here for the disability uh, income insurance uh, model, we apparently end up with two differential equations where these differential equations are going to describe the evolution of the uh, policy value over time. And as you can expect, this will then also give us a tool to do the actual calculation of, of policy values. Because if you can look at the set of differential equations, and if you can start with a specific value at a boundary point, uh, so either at time zero or at time uh, n, say the end point of the contract, then by using a numerical, uh, a numerical scheme like the Euler scheme to solve this set of, of differential equations, then you can quickly evaluate these, um, uh, these policy, policy values. And you also see that that is really necessary to solve them simultaneously because you see that the differential equation for the policy value in state zero is relying on the one uh, for state one and, and vice versa. So you really have to approach this uh, system of equations uh, jointly. Okay, so this is one particular example of what we called in the title uh, the Thiele differential equation that is um, describing the evolution of the policy values uh, over time. So we want to make sure that we grasp the intuition behind these uh, differential equations so that we can leverage uh, these insights from this particular example to the very general multi-state set. TV, TV0, which is uh, the, the cash, if you want. Uh, so it's the amount of capital that the, that the insurance uh, company uh, insurer is holding at time zero. Sorry, at time T, given that the policyholder is in state zero. Yeah, that's how we should see it. So it's an amount of capital, it's a balancing item that we need to hold at time T if our policyholder is in state zero. So now we're gonna watch what's gonna happen if we 
look at some time points, t plus h, which is not very far from t, and which is within the duration of our contract, and the duration of our contract is this n. So the first question that I'm going to ask myself is, how does this capital that I'm holding, how does it grow from t to t plus h? So if I picture this on a timeline, okay, we've got time t, we've got time t plus h, voila, and I'm holding the amount tv0 at time t. It's a it's a, an amount of money, it's a, it's, a, it's a basket of money, let's say. So if I let it grow till time t plus h, then it's going to grow to an amount tv0 multiplied with e to the power delta times h. Now, if delta is my force of interest, this is how my capital accumulates over this uh, interval of length h. Yeah? But on the other hand, I can also say, um, that's one thing. On the other hand, premium will also come in. A premium uh, as an insurance company, a premium will flow in between time t and t plus h. And premium is going to come in at a continuous rate p per year. So the premium inflow uh, between in the interval from t to t plus h I can see that as P, my annual rate. And now I should um, look at the growth of this premium income and I should accumulate it between zero and H. It's a bit strange. You don't, ah, okay, it's back. So this is how I can describe um, the premium inflow and, and the growth of this premium between t and t plus h. So in total, if I look at the amount of capital that I'm holding, uh, the amount of capital grows to tv0 multiplied with e to the power delta times h plus p times the integral like this. And that's the amount of capital at t plus h. Good. And first of all, I can think about this and I can say, well, let's do a, a small um, uh, Taylor approximation of this uh, exponential function. Uh, let's work out this integral so that we've got a better grip on what this expression uh, would be like. Okay, so that's the first thing we're going to do. I'm not sure if you hear all these sounds, but there seems to be quite some lockdown uh, excitement among my boys at the moment, so sorry for that. It's been a while, right, that uh, all of us have to um, deal with the situation. It's a bit stressful from time to time. So if I work out this integral, then I'll get something like this. And if I use a, a Taylor approximation, then I can also say that e to the power delta is 1 plus delta times h plus little rho of h. So putting it all together, The amount of capital that I hold at time t plus h, starting from the capital that I was holding at time t for somebody who's occupying state, state zero at that time, I can write it uh, like this. So it's tv zero multiplied with one plus delta times h plus p times, and then I'm going to use this guy here, this expression, but I'm going to replace the e to the power, uh, this should be delta times uh, h, right? Voila. 
So I'm going to use this. Uh, I'm going to use this guy and plug it into the expression over here, such that I can simplify this to p times h plus little o of h. That's the amount of capital that I'm holding at um, at time t plus h. Yeah. That's what I get if I start with this um, basket of money at time t and I let it grow uh, to time t plus h. And I'm also aware that there is an inflow of premiums and so on. Now, this amount, which I hold at t plus h, should be equal to what I need for my um, policyholder, for my, uh, in terms of my, of my policy amount at time t plus h. Yeah. So this amount should be equal to, or it should be sufficient to cover Yeah, equal to is a better word. Should be equal to the following setting. So should be equal to what you need to hold in terms of the policy value at time t plus h. So that is t plus h v0 plus possibly some extra amounts. And that depends on what your, um, the kind of state that your policy holder is gonna occupy at time t plus h. So if the policyholder is in state zero, then this is the policy value that you would need at t plus h. But on the other hand, if your policyholder is in state one uh, at time uh, t plus h, then you will need to hold a different policy value, right? Or if your policyholder is in state two at time uh, t plus h, then you would have to pay uh, the, the lump sum. So we're gonna, we're gonna make a distinction here with what's gonna uh, happen in terms of a switch of states, let's say. So the possible extra amounts are S minus T plus H V zero. If the policyholder dies, and that's gonna happen with a probability uh, H times mu X plus T zero two, was a little o of h. That's what we discussed uh, last week. So if you make the transition, if you're gonna die between time uh, t and t plus h, yeah, that's um, that transition probability is expressed with the following expression, with uh, as follows. And that's what we discussed uh, last week, and that's the probability to go from zero into state two, yeah, between time t and t plus h. That's how you can express this transition uh, probability. And so last week we said that this guy is approx approximately equal to h p x plus t zero two. That's what we that's what we needed. And of course, if that's going to happen, then we do no longer need the policy value v zero. Uh, so there is a uh, that's, that's becoming free. Yeah? Um, we get rid of the, the necessity to hold this, this policy value. But what we need then is the lump sum S that has to be paid at time T plus H. Yeah? So if you see, if my policy in, in, in this scenario that is taking place with this probability, I need to add the following term to the policy value T plus H V0. And of course, something else can happen. That's the second uh, scenario. I will need to add the amount t plus h v1. And I can get rid of the t plus h v0 if my policyholder falls sick. And that's going to happen with a probability uh, h multiplied with mu x plus t01 plus little o. Of H. And that's the probability, once again, to make this transition from 0 to 1 in, an, in the interval between t and t plus h. So why can I write it like, uh, like this? Because, of course, if my policyholder at time t plus h is in state 1, I will need to hold this amount. 
right? So if I write it as it's this amount plus something extra, and then I need to subtract here the, the policy value, which I no longer need if my policyholder uh, falls sick instead of is in state uh, zero. So if I put all of these scenarios uh, together, I'll get the following expression from which we can then deduce our differential equation. So we set the amount of capital that we will have at time zero, that at time, sorry, at time t plus h, that's this one, that's uh, achieved by letting the capital grow at a rate uh, delta from t to t plus h. And this is also achieved by receiving this uh, premium income at a continuous uh, uh, rate. And this should be sufficient to, or this should be equal to the amount of capital that I actually need at time t plus h. And that amount of capital can be expressed as follows. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to rearrange this whole expression and I'm going to write it as follows. So I put the t plus h v0 on top. I have then 1 minus h times mu x plus t 0 1 minus h times mu x plus t 0 2 plus h multiplied with mu x plus t 0 2 times s plus h multiplied with mu x plus t 0 1 t plus h v 1 plus little o of h. So that's just the rearranging of the terms where I put everything that is using the t plus h v 0 together and then I've got the term that is uh, coming with the lump sum s and I've got the expression that comes with the policy value um, at time t plus h for a policyholder in state. Okay. So if I would uh, start working with this uh, expression, then it turns out that if I rearrange everything, and I'm going to skip a few steps here, which you can do uh, yourself. So if I start rearranging this whole thing, I'll get something like this. So I bring certain terms to the other side and I'm really working towards recognizing here a derivative, right? So that's something like this. Okay, so that's just about rearranging the terms. And then of course, what I want to do is I want to take the limit for h running to zero at both sides, because then I can recognize here yeah, the negative derivative in fact. Yeah? So it's the derivative, but it's uh, with a negative sign. So I'll bring the negative sign to the other side and then I'll uh, retrieve here the derivative with respect to t of t v zero. Uh, which is then equal to delta times t v0 plus p uh, minus mu x plus t01 times t v1 minus t v0 minus mu x plus t02 and here you have s minus t v0 and that is exactly this uh, differential equation one of the differential equations uh, by Thiele uh, that is applicable here to the disability uh, multi-state model. I guess that's what I wanted to show here. Uh, so it's a bit of a rearranging of the, of the expressions to recognize here the derivative with respect to time of your policy value at time, at time t. And this is, of course, for the policyholder occupying uh, state, state zero at time t, but I can do a completely similar reasoning for a policyholder uh, occupying one of the other states at time t. And the only difference is that here you will have to think carefully, okay, if, if I have a policyholder at, um, 
who's occupying state one at time t plus h, what kind of, uh, of scenarios would be, would be possible here with uh, corresponding probabilities, putting that all together uh, and so on. Yeah? So that's important. This leaves me to, or this creates for me a differential equation that expresses the um, evolution of the policy value over time. And if I return to the sheet, this was exactly the first of these, um, the first expression that you see on the sheet over here. If I do it in a completely similar way, then I'll get something uh, like, like this. Yeah? Do note here I've got plus P, here it will become minus B, because of course the, the role of premiums uh, which you receive as a company versus sickness benefits that you have to pay as a company, that role is, is, is opposite in sign, right? Uh, premiums are an inflow, benefits are an outflow. Let me conclude this with a, with a brief example. And then if, so here you see a simple example then. Uh, we put in some precise values. We say the policyholder is 40 years old. The duration of the contract is 20 years. The force of interest is 4%. Uh, those were the good times. Um, B is 100,000, so that's the sickness benefit, and then the lump sum at death is uh, 500,000. We specify some uh, values or expressions for the transition intensity, so we can go from 0 to 1, we can go from 1 to 0, we can go from... Um, no, that's odd, that's a typo here. We can go from 0 to 2, of course, not the other way around, and we can go from one to two. Yeah? So this is a, a typo because uh, going from t, t, two to zero is, is not possible. Um, so sorry for that. And the question is now calculate the policy values at certain points in, in time. If n is 20 and given that p is 5,500. Yeah? So that might seem a bit odd here. So, so we get a value for the premium which we can use in our differential equations uh, for the evolution of, of the policy value. And having this value of P, we're asked to do some calculations uh, for the policy value. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna work with the derivative of uh, the policy value. We can express it like, like this for a small time step H. And we're gonna rewrite our differential equations such that you recognize once again this, this Euler scheme, huh? such that if you start from a certain boundary value for V0 and for V1, that then by using small steps of H, you can come up with a numerical um, evaluation scheme to get the policy values for a policyholder in state one, in state zero, uh, at any time point, okay? And of course, what are these boundary conditions? Well, for the boundary conditions, we can say at the end of the contract, so at time point n, you do no longer need a policy value. So your policy value then drops to zero because it's the end of the contract. You have no future obligations uh, towards your uh, policy holders. So if you start there with a value of zero, then you can, using this scheme, you can calculate the policy value at time point n minus h. You can calculate uh, the policy value at time point n minus h for state zero and for state one, and you can continue like this. Okay, and that will also deliver you the requested policy value at time 10. Now here you have to be careful. Uh, when is the policy value at time zero? When is that equal to zero? That is only equal to zero if we're using the equivalent uh, premium. So if we use the premium that is determined by actuarial equivalence. And in this case, we got from the example a value for P of, of 5,500 or something, which is not necessarily the premium rate determined by actuarial equivalence. Yeah? Um, so that's a bit, uh, that's, that's also one of the, the questions in the rest of the example. Uh, so if you would have to calculate P using the equivalence uh, principle, what the authors of the book do is they evaluate 
the, um, the policy value at time zero for two given different values of, of P. And then they use a kind of proportionality um, argument in order to calculate then the value of P star, the premium that is calculated at uh, actuarial equivalence. Yeah? So I didn't really, ex or I didn't go into detail about this, um, this part of the example. Um, let me check the time. So maybe I can write down one extra word about this uh, part B of the example, just to make sure that we um, understand this, this correctly. Yeah. So we are able to calculate the policy values. And if you read in the book, then uh, essentially what we do is we get policy, uh, we get a premium P and we get the corresponding uh, policy value for a policyholder in state zero at time zero. And in the book, they give us two values of P. And they say, what if P is 5,500? Then we can use our uh, differential equation and we can use our uh, Euler scheme and come up with the corresponding value for, for V at time zero. And that turns out to be 3,850. Okay, that's what you can see in the book. That is, if I, if I have this value for P, then what does this guy become from the differential equation that I put together? And on the other hand, in the book, they also do this for another value, P is 6,000. And then I get the policy value at time zero, which is minus and so on. Okay, so that's given in the book. And now the next question is, what is then P star? which would be the premium determined by actuarial equivalence. And the idea is that we're going to solve this not by actually writing down the uh, actuarial equivalent relationship and then solving it for P star, but we're going to do this with a quick and dirty argument. And we're going to say, yeah, let us picture um, the two points that we have. So if this is P and if this is 0 V0, then I've got now for P 5,500 and for P equal to 6,000, I've got the value 3,815, that's here. And for the other guy, I've got a value of, uh, say, minus, 2,617. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line through these two values. Yeah. And I'm going to say, which P am I looking for? I'm looking for the P star here, such that the corresponding V is equal to zero. Because that's what the actuarial equivalent premium will lead me to. And that would be the premium such that uh, for the policy holder at time zero in the zero state, the policy value is equal to zero. So here, with this quick and dirty um, argument, if I write down the, the expression for this line through these given two points, I can quickly get what the uh, value for P star um, would be. Yeah? So that's the way how uh, this exercise is solved in the book using this uh, proportionality. Uh, so as announced, I'll take a um, couple of minutes to guide you through this um, uh, general expression for the Thiele uh, differential uh, equations. But there is nothing new in fact, uh, that's just what we did um, for the example of the disability income insurance model. Um, same kind of thinking, same kind of reasoning, but now in a general uh, notation. Good. So we have a policy uh, which is issued um, to a policyholder HX. We assume that the duration of the contract is n years. We've got a multi-state model. Um, ah, and this is a, a sloppy notation because we cannot use n for the duration and then n for the um, number of states different from, from zero. So I would have to adjust uh, one of these ends, sorry. 
Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to specify the transition intensity, so from I to J at a certain H. We define delta T as the force of interest. Um, we now assume that this force of interest can change over time, so we index with, with a T. We've got BTI, that's the rate of benefit payment at time T, uh, if the policyholder is in state I. And we've got the lump sum STIJ that is payable instantaneously at time T if I make the transition from I to J. So these are the ingredients that we have to work with. Um, you may wonder, yeah, where are the premiums? Of course, the premiums can be considered as negative benefits uh, for somebody who is occupying the state, uh, state zero, typically. Yeah? So the premiums are, in fact, included in the, um, the benefit payments which are uh, expressed, captured in the third bullet uh, over here. So if I have this very general multi-state uh, model, I can write down the um, expression for the evolution of the policy values over time for a policy holder who is in state i at time t. And I'm coming up with uh, expressions like, like this, uh, where we recognize kind of the same structure as what we had in the, in the example for the disability income, uh, income insurance um, uh, setting. Because if you look at what we have for the um, disability income insurance uh, product, uh, for instance, for the policyholder occupying state, uh, state zero, we would have here delta times TV zero. We would then have plus P uh, because then we receive uh, negative benefits in the term in the form of, um, of premiums as an insurance company. And we had minus mu zero one. And then here we would have TV1 minus TV0 because there is no lump sum to be paid if I make the transition from active to uh, disabled. And then I would have minus mu02 multiplied with S minus TV0 in case my uh, policyholder makes the transition to the debt state. Yeah? So if you work with this general scheme, uh, as given over here, if you go back now to the example on the disability income insurance product, then you should be able to match the expression that we derived over there with this general setting of Thiele's uh, differential uh, equations. Okay, so I'm not going to derive this uh, in, in, in more detail, but the reasoning is really the same kind of reasoning as what we did for the example before the break. Yeah? And also do remember this is an open book exam. Uh, so there is no point in learning this expression uh, by heart. You will have uh, this kind of stuff available during the exam. Uh, you have this available to, to work with. Good. Uh, in chapter seven from the book on uh, basic life insurance, on life insurance mathematics, there is also the Thiele differential equation for the alive debt model. So I'm not sure for this year, but typically Professor Dana does not cover that in his class. Uh, but in case he did, then you would have another connection with this, um, with, the, with the differential equations shown here on the sheet. Because of course the alive debt model is just one particular example of a multi-state model. And here of course, in the alive debt model, of course, you will only have one differential equation that matters the one describing the evolution of the policy value in the um, active alive state. Okay. Good. Um, oh yeah, I, I included some intuition, but I, I suggest you read this uh, because that's exactly the kind of reasoning that we brought up in discussing the example on, on disability income insurance. And we're gonna work with this uh, example. So I quickly took an exercise from a, a previous exam. Uh, it's not a long exercise. It's also not a very complicated exercise, but it's good to discuss it at, at this point. We've got the following multi-state model, healthy state, sick state, dead state. Following transitions are possible. Yeah, we've got an interest rate uh, in discrete time of 5%. Uh, we've got a certain notation for the transitions between the different uh, states. Okay, so picture that. 
And then I'm going to launch a uh, first question. And that is if we have a few transition probabilities given. Right? So this, this table is given, it gives you certain transition probabilities on the one year horizon. Yeah, so some numeric values to, to work with in the question. Um, then the first question could be, if you look at the expressions over here, try to order them from uh, small to, to large. So let's first look at, look at those probabilities and try to order them from uh, small to, to largest. What can you say uh, about those? What you find over here, so TPX00 bar, that's the smallest probability. Why? Because it's the sojourn probability. And so that's really the probability that you will spend um, all your time between Hx and x plus t in the healthy state. So you're not allowed to leave that state uh, in this, in this uh, probability. So that's the event where you stay. Then if we look at the, at the product of these two one-year probabilities, so that means that um, you start in the healthy state at hx and then if we look at 1px00 that's the probability that you will be in the healthy state again at hx plus one and of course you you may have left the state in between but at hx plus one you're again in the uh, state zero and then if we multiply with this probability it means that we're going to multiply with the probability that you will again be in the healthy state at hx plus two. Yeah? So here we look at all those events where you start in the healthy state at hx, you're in the healthy state at x plus one, and you're in the healthy state at x plus two. And in between, you may have left uh, and so on. Yeah? And then the last probability, the 2px00, uh, that means what's the probability that you will start in the healthy state? at hx, you will be in the healthy state at hx plus two, but what, the, what happens in between, uh, we don't care, okay? So all the events that are included in this probability you know, will also be included in this probability, but the latter probability will also capture more possible uh, paths or, or events, namely those events where you uh, are not necessarily in the healthy state at hx plus one, while you are in the healthy state at hx plus two. So that's why we have the particular ordering as proposed on top of the sheet. Let's go back to the questions then. If I look at question B, what is now the probability that a life who is healthy at age 60 is healthy at age 62? And the probability that a life who is healthy at, small typo here, at age 60, is sick at age uh, 62. So I'm asked to calculate the following probability. Yeah? And I have these one year probabilities available. So I can say, I can do it like, like this. There are only two scenarios uh, possible. And that's the scenario where I'm in, um, sorry, where I'm in state zero at age um, 61, yeah. Um, and what I want to know, okay, what's then the probability that I will be again in state zero at age 62? Or I can look at those scenarios where I say at age uh, 61, and I made a typo here. Um, should be like this, right? So here is the events or the path where I say at age 61, I'm in state one, and then I will make sure that I get back to the healthy state uh, before age 62, okay? So using the probabilities from the table, I can actually do this calculation and I can come up with a numerical uh, answer. So this is a bit of a particular situation because in fact, I'm working in discrete time. Uh, I'm working with these discrete time probabilities that are given. I'm not going to write it with some differential equation or with some uh, integral expression or something. No, I can just get this uh, requested probability in discrete time from the probabilities given in the table. And here you've got something uh, similar. So here I say 
you can go to um, state zero and then from state zero to state one, or you can do this in a different way. You can go like this. And again, you look at your table and you do the maths and find the uh, requested probability. Yeah. So here it's a matter of distinguishing the possible paths. So for instance, here the path is from zero to zero to one, or the path is from zero to one to one, right? Where the intermediate times or, or the, the points that I indicate here is what's happening at t is zero, at t is one, and at t is two. Good, and putting that all together, I get my requested um, probabilities. Yeah. Does that make sense? So that was my question B. Uh, so nothing uh, spectacular here, I would say. That's uh, the uh, probabilities that I had to calculate for which you can see the numerics uh, over here. Then part C and part uh, D in this uh, question. In part C, we're going to look at the expected present value of a three-year annuity due, one euro per year, each payment being conditional on being healthy at the payment date for a life who's currently aged 60 and who is um, healthy. Yeah, so we start with a policyholder aged 60 in the healthy state, so in state uh, zero. We're going to look at a three-year annuity due, one euro per year. So it's a discrete product. It's an annuity due, so that means that the annuity is paid at the beginning of the year. It's, uh, these payments are made in advance. And here the payment is conditional on being healthy at the payment date. Okay. So let's take a look at that. How would you value, how would you value such a product? How would you write that down and then do the calculations using your uh, probabilities in the table? So first of all, some notation. It's a small a for annuity. I've got a 60 year old and I look at an annuity with a duration of three years. The annuity is in discrete time. So I put my double dots. I'm now in state zero and the condition to, to pay huh, is that my policyholder is again in state uh, zero. The annuity works first of all in advance. Yeah. So hence the double dots. So if I would picture my timeline, I'll get something like, like this. So this is t is zero, I'm 60 year old. This is t is one, I'm 61 year old. T is two, I'm 62 years old. And t is three, uh, I'm 63 years old. So let's continue this, um, this uh, story. So we want to know, uh, will I get the one euro here, the one euro here, and the one euro here. So these are three payments, but they are conditional on the fact that I need to be in state zero in order to receive these, uh, these payments. I can also visualize, of course, my discounting because that will go from time one to time zero. And here I will do the discounting from time two to time zero, yeah? So my uh, expression for this annuity will then be one plus, here I've got my discount factor that will be V, and here I've got my discount factor that will be V squared, and I have to multiply with the probability that this payment will happen. So that's gonna be P6000, and here it's gonna be P62. I need to be there in two years from now, zero. Zero. So, so do note that uh, the first payment here is, is guaranteed because my annuity is paying in advance. I'm currently in the healthy state. So that's why I just got this, this one. There is no discounting. There is no probability to be taken into account over here. If I would do this in Rio, so that means at the end of the year. So then my timeline would similarly look like uh, this. And then I'm wondering, uh, do I get my one euro here? Do I get it over here? Do I get it over here? 
I need to discount to the present moment. Voila. And I need to take the probabilities into account that this payment is going to take place. So I'll get something like this. Voila. So that would be the um, similar expression if I pay in arrear, if I pay at the end of the, of the year. Good. Questions on this? And of course, if you take then the probabilities from the table, uh, then you're capable of, of, of calculating all these transition probabilities that you need. You can plug them in over here and, and you can find uh, the solution. Also do note, maybe that's good to, to remember, one plus i to the power minus one, that's my discount factor v, if I work in, in discrete uh, if I work in discrete time. So the I is given here, the interest rate is given, uh, so I can get my discount factors uh, from here. Okay. To a healthy policyholder issued. Yeah. So let me write down the benefit or the lump sum with S. And then I'm wondering, yeah, what is the probability that this S will be paid at the end of the first year. Well, if S is paid at the end of the first year, that's gonna happen with a probability P6002. And I've got a discount factor for one year, so from time one to time zero, so that's V. And then if this um, S is, is gonna be paid at the end of the, so I've got 60, I've got 61, 62, and 63, right? So if, the, if that occurs in this first year, then this S is going to be paid over here. If that occurs in this um, second year, yeah, then uh, the S is going to be paid right here. And if the death occurs here, then the S is going to be paid over here. Okay, so that's how I need to discount. I need to go from there to there. I need to go from here to the present moment and from here to that, okay? So if I do V squared, then what's the probability that I need? That's the probability that I will be making the transition to the dead state between age 61 and 62. So I can do that in this way or I can do that by coming from the, the sick state and going from there to the dead state. Yeah? So there are two paths that I can follow here. In this first path, I stay in the healthy state until age uh, 61. And then some, somewhere between age uh, 61 and 62, I make my transition into the um, dead state. And here I make the transition to the disability state uh, before age 61. I'm in the disabled state at age 61 and I'm gonna go from there to the dead state. So these are the scenarios I want to take into account. And then for the last part, I've got my V to the power three, right? And here I'm gonna say the possible scenarios are like uh, this going from zero to two or I can go there from state one and move into state two. So that's everything I need to put together and that gives me then the EPV of the insurance uh, benefit. Yeah. In order to calculate the premium I need to put uh, the EPV of this product equal to the EPV of the premium payments. And then to see these uh, premium payments, I think we already did that. So for the premium payments, we say that premiums are payable annually in advance if I'm in the uh, healthy state. So that's exactly what I was calculating in, in part uh, C. 
So putting that together, uh, I should uh, be able to put, to put this guy, uh, the answer for D, equal to yeah, P times uh, the guy that I have over here and solve this equation uh, for P. Okay, that's, uh, the, that's how you can solve it in total um, over here. Any questions uh, related to this exercise? So it's a discrete time exercise. Um, that's important to keep in mind here. And then of course you have to think about all the possible paths that are applicable to the, to the product that you need to, that you need to pass. So we have the following multi-state uh, setting and we're gonna analyze now the, the sensitivity of some of our assumptions used in determining the premium rate for a sickness uh, policy. So we frame this picture. We've got the following uh, given. Level premiums, so that means, means uh, premiums that stay constant. They are paid continuously in the healthy state. Sickness benefits are paid continuously in the sick state. There is no debt benefit. That's what we're going to assume. And then the question is, if you look at these five um, statements, which of these five statements is certain to increase your premium rate? So think, think for a moment about this. Now you've got the healthy, sick, and uh, dead states. You've got transitions between them. You know that you're gonna pay premiums in the healthy state. Uh, you're gonna receive sickness benefits in the a disabled state and and you're also um, in this example and we also know that we're not going to pay any uh, debt benefits and now the question is if you look at these five statements uh, when are you sure that you're going to increase your premium uh, rate so statement d is in fact the the only statement huh, for which uh, both elements in the statement so both the lower recovery rate from the sixth state as well as the lower mortality rate to the sixth state um, are, are making sure that the premium has to become uh, more expensive. I think I've got one last um, exercise to play with. It's a bit more theoretical. Uh, so you will need the expression uh, for, for Thiele um, in order to solve this multiple choice question, but we've got again healthy state, the sick state, and the dead state. And we've got the following things given. So we pay the premiums continuously at a rate P. While we are in the healthy state, we have the sickness benefits, which are payable continuously at the rate B per year, while the policyholder is sick. There are no dead benefits. We've got our transition intensities um, mu i j, we've got a force of interest and we've got the notation t v i. And now the question is uh, which of the following is then correct for Thiele's uh, differential equation? So here you would have to look back at the expression that we put together for Thiele. Here it's a lot about the plus and the minus. Huh? So which of those uh, expressions would be correct according to you? Let's see if we combine this with our um, expression for Thiele. And so if you take the Thiele expression, if, if you have it available, um, I, I guess this is not uh, too difficult to, to answer. So we've got here on top the general expression for Thiele's um, differential equation. So my handwriting is not very clear, but this is delta T, the force of interest at time T. And this is ST, this is my lump sum that I would pay if I make the transition from state I to, to state J, right? So that's a given. So if I clarify this a little bit, this is my S, like this. And now I'm asked to sort of apply this uh, set of, of, of uh, differential equations to the um, healthy sick debt model. And I'm asked to come up with the expression for the evolution of the policy value in the sickness state. So I'm fixing here state S. So I will for sure get delta times the TVS here. 
and I will get minus BTS because if I have a policyholder in the in the sickness state, then this B will be the sickness benefits that the insurance company uh, has to pay. So this has to come with a minus. Yeah? And then I'm going to look at which transitions are possible out of state uh, S. So from state S, I can make the transition to state H, the healthy state, or to state D, that is the dead state. Okay. And then in the TILA, I've got my, my lump sum that has to be paid if I make this transition, but there are no such lump sums to be paid in, in this particular example, because if I make the transition to the debt state, there is no debt benefit um, that is guaranteed. Yeah? So this is dropped from my uh, expression. And then if I look at the VJ minus the VS, uh, then there is one last thing that I need to keep in mind. If the J is equal to the dead state, uh, so if I look at the, the T, sorry, in red, the TVD, uh, the TVD, that is zero, because if I'm in the dead state, there is no uh, policy value that I, uh, that I should hold. And uh, so this will be uh, dropped from the expression, and then I get a minus here multiplied with minus the transition. Uh, intensity. So if you put that all together, uh, you should get expression E as the, as the correct answer over here. Okay. So if I go back to the different expressions, this was the one I had for, uh, for E. So it's minus B, it's a transition from S to H, and then I've got VH minus VS, no lump sum. And then for the case where I make the transition from S to D, that would come with a plus because the policy value drops to zero if I make the transition 